uh, on the uh, COVID um, uh, pandemic, essentially. And um, this is really just meant to um, get people up to speed if you haven't been able to follow um, as closely as you would have liked. Um, and I did ask that Eric and Aaron um, save some time at the end for questions. Um, and I hope that there's a uh, robust discussion. I do apologize. I do have to hop over to another call, so I won't be able to um, stay for the full hour, um, but um, I do hope that everyone enjoys the, the conference today, and our goal is to likely make the next several Wednesday talks um, relevant to uh, the current pandemic, just so everyone knows the CME code for today is update. Thanks very much. Thanks, Molly. So as, as Molly mentioned, um, my name is Eric Meyerwitz. I'm the MGH HIV Fellow. And again, my co-presenter is Aaron Richterman, who's the Brigham and Women's HIV Fellow. And um, we are delighted to be uh, giving this lecture today. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, so again, we'll be, re we'll be trying to review um, what's known about this new disease uh, by going through the literature to date and describing what, what is out there. We're not going to be able to cover everything. Uh, but we hope this is helpful for, for everyone. Just in terms of uh, housekeeping, um, if you can, if there are technical issues or questions, just uh, put them into the chat. And then as Molly said, we'll, we'll, have question, we'll have time for questions at the end as well. Next slide, please. So this slide is, uh, is really just to show the rapid growth of the literature on COVID-19 to date. So as you can see, um, this this is a resource called called LitCovid um, that that uh, is basically a central hub for all the literature being uh, being published about this. And as you can see, there's really an exponential growth, and there's been some incredibly important papers in the last several weeks. Um, on on PubMed, as of this morning, there's 1,642 papers about COVID, and on MedArchive and BioArchive, there's uh, another 700 at least 760 preprints. And so we're gonna we're gonna try to go through uh, some of these. Next slide, please. So this is our outline for today's lecture. Uh, we're gonna do a brief uh, brief review of some of the essential virology. Uh, we're gonna take some time to discuss transmission, incubation period, viral shedding, and then we'll move on to dis to discuss spectrum of clinical presentation. Uh, consider what are thought currently to be some of the major risk factors for developing severe disease. Next, we'll review a couple of special populations, and then we'll move on to management and go through the data, uh, obviously the limited data so far behind some of the treatments that are being offered at this time. And finally, we're gonna end looking at population risk and mitigation. Next slide, please. So again, I'm just gonna cover the very basics of virology, just a few highlights, uh, because I think it's important to understanding some of the manifestations of COVID, as well as providing a rationale for some of the treatments that are currently under investigation. So um, next slide, please. So again, so just very, very uh, sort of uh, simple high level overview. In terms of the virus, there are structural proteins and non-structural proteins. The most important structural protein uh, for our purposes is the S or spike protein that's required for cellular entry uh, or for, for, for viral entry into the cell, I should say. The major non-structural proteins are, the, are an RNA dependent RNA polymerase and a helicase. Um, and then there are two, there are two important uh, viral proteases that cleave uh, the non-structural protein. So there's a paffin-like protease or a PL protease, and there's a 3CL protease. On the host side, uh, so what we know is the ACE2 membrane-bound receptor is the major receptor used uh, for, uh, by the virus for entry into the cell. And so uh, and the, S, the S protein um, binds to the ACE2 receptor and enters through endocytosis. There's also a second non-endocytosis entry uh, pathway through the plasma membrane. This involves a host protease that's also, so it's a membrane browned host protease called TMPRSS2. This cleaves S into subunits and allows for entry at the plasma membrane. Um, next slide, please. So this was actually a, a really great paper from Nature uh, in uh, 2016. And, and just showed, that this was looking obviously not at uh, SARS-CoV-2, but at SARS and MERS uh, related beta uh, coronaviruses. Uh, SARS-CoV uh, SARS also uh, enters through the ACE2 receptor. And so, and so it's, I think it's quite, still quite useful. So as um, Aaron's circling up on the top left, uh, that's a schematic of essentially the virus with, with the spike protein um, binding to the ACE2 receptor and then entering through an endosomal pathway. And on the top on the right, you can see 
um, this other pathway at the plasma membrane, again, that involves uh, cleavage of the S uh, protein into the subunits and then entry, entry there through a non-endocytosis pathway. Down about uh, halfway, middle of the screen, you can see the two viral proteases, the papin-like protease and the 3CL protease which again are important in terms of uh, for, for, for cleaving the non-structural proteins, the RNA, dependent RNA polymerase and the helicase. Um, next slide, please. All right, so I'm gonna <clears throat> be speaking a little bit about transmission of the virus in the incubation period. Uh, and to start with, let's discuss environmental viability. And so this was a study published about a week ago in the New England Journal, which looked at the stability of SARS-CoV-2 in aerosols on the left and on various surfaces on the right with estimations of the decay rates. And so what they did in this experiment was they generated aerosols uh, with 50% of the tissue culture infectious dose uh, of SARS-CoV-2 per milliliter, which is similar to those observed clinically in the respiratory tract of in uh, infected individuals. And the left figure, you can see that they found that SARS-CoV-2 remained viable in aerosols throughout the duration of the experiment, which was three hours although the titer uh, was reduced by nearly a log over that time period. This does not imply uh, that the virus is routinely aerosolized outside of experimental condi uh, conditions, but does highlight the risk of transmission during and after uh, aerosolizing procedures. Uh, on the right, you can see that the virus is more stable on, on plastic and stainless steel in the bottom two figures compared to copper and cardboard in the top two figures and that virus was isolated up to 72 hours after the application to steel and plastic, uh, although the titer was greatly reduced. This is a study from Annals published about two weeks ago uh, evaluating the incubation period of the virus, or the time from exposure to symptom onset. And if you take a look at the figure on the left, in this study they looked at 181 confirmed cases, with each case a horizontal line. The blue shaded area is the time of potential exposure, the red shaded area uh, is, the, is the time of potential symptom onset. Uh, the green point is the time of case detection, and the blue and red points are the uh, midpoints for the blue and red shaded areas. So they took information from these 181 cases and generated this figure on the right, which is the cumulative distribution function of the incubation period. They estimated that the median incubation period is 5.1 days with long tails in either direction. The median incubation period is similar to SARS and about two and a half times longer than influenza. And with this analysis, they estimated that less than two and a half percent of cases would become symptomatic within 2.2 days of exposure, and that 97.5% of cases would become symptomatic within 11.5 days of exposure. Importantly, one out of 100 cases will develop symptoms after the 14-day monitoring period. So there have been a number of studies looking at viral identification, either RNA or live virus, at various sites and during various time points. In this table, you can see uh, in the left column where SARS-CoV-2 has been isolated and whether it has been live virus or just viral RNA. This includes live virus in the sputum, upper airway uh, and nasopharynx, stool with just a couple reports of live virus, blood, again, very rarely, and uh, viral RNA from the conjunctiva. To date, there's been no SARS-CoV-2 uh, isolated in the urine, breast milk, amniotic fluid, or infant cord blood. And as far as we could find, CF CSF has not yet been evaluated. This is a study from two hospitals in Hong Kong published uh, in Lancet ID this past Sunday. They looked at 23 patients, uh, 10 with severe disease and 13 mild, and evaluated serial viral loads in uh, posterior oropharyngeal saliva in blue and endotracheal aspirates in red. And what they found was that the highest viral loads were around the time of symptom onset with a decline over time. And that 30% of this cohort still had detectable virus at 20 days after a symptom onset, suggesting that viral load may peak around the time of symptom onset. This study is a preprint from a German group published earlier this month where they looked at nine mild young to middle-aged cases in Germany with each panel representing one case. They have uh, evaluated serial viral RNA from the nasopharynx, which is the yellow lines, uh, and the sputum, the orange lines, and found an earlier drop in the nasopharyngeal RNA compared to sputum, suggesting the possibility of a descending infection. They also looked at antibody production with seroconversion uh, occurring about six to 12 days after symptom onset and marked with these red arrows. 
you can see that zero conversion was followed by a rapid decline uh, in viral loads. This is a study published March 21st in CID that further explored the potential role of serology in diagnosis. Um, they, looked at, uh, they looked at multiple samples from 101 people hospitalized at one center in China during the early epidemic. 43 of these uh, patients had confirmed COVID-19, meaning a positive PCR, and 58 had probable disease with negative PCR, but a typical clinical presentation. They found an IgM positivity rate of 85%, becoming positive a median of five days after symptom onset, and an IgG positivity rate of 78%, becoming a, media, a positive a median of 14 days after symptom onset. Now, if you look at the figure on the top left, IgM was positive 75% of confirmed cases and 93% of probable cases, perhaps related to the time after symptom onset that these samples taken, again, remembering that uh, PCR positivity seems to peak around the time of symptom onset. Um, if you look at the top right figure, you can see that the positive detection rate increased from 51.9% to 98.6% when combining IgM with PCR uh, compared with single PCR. And finally, the bottom figure puts this all together. The x-axis is days after symptom onset, and you can see the curve fits of PCR positive rate in black, IgG positive rates uh, in green, and IgM positive rates in orange. Their model suggests that there's a PCR positive rate greater than 90% on days one through three, but that this falls to less than 80% at day six and less than 50% after day 14. Furthermore, the detection efficiency by PCR is greater than IgM before 5.5 days, but the reverse is true after 5.5 days, with the detection efficiency of IgM greater than that by PCR. And this suggests that IgM may ultimately be helpful uh, for diagnosis um, of COVID-19. This is a study published last week in Lancet ID of 76 patients at one hospital in China that suggests that severe cases of COVID-19 may have higher viral loads with longer shedding. 61% of the patients included were mild uh, and 39% were severe, and they collected nasopharyngeal specimens. In the left figure, you can see comparisons at the time of presentation of cycle thresholds here in the y-axis, meaning the number of cycles required for the PCR to cross the threshold of positivity. So lower numbers are, can be thought of as sort of as more positive. Um, they stratify by days after symptom onset, um, and the mild cases are in blue, and the more severe cases are in red. Uh, you can see that the cycle threshold is lower, meaning more easily positive in severe cases, and they also reported in the study that the mean viral load of severe cases was 60 times higher than in mild cases. In the right figure um, are the cases in which they had serial samples available, again with the mild cases in blue and the severe cases in red. You can see that the mild cases had earlier viral clearance with 90% being negative by day 10 after symptom onset. All severe cases tested positive at or beyond 10 days. Again, this suggests that viral load may be a useful marker for assessing disease severity and prognosis. So a preprint posted earlier this week describes the early epidemic in Italy during which they screened asymptomatic contacts of known COVID-19 patients. They found that viral loads from these asymptomatic individuals were similar to those from symptomatic patients, although the caveat is that we don't know whether these individuals were asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, as we've seen in a number of other studies that pre-symptomatic people can have high viral loads, particularly in the couple days preceding symptom onset. With that in mind, this is a somewhat provocative study that looked at just over a thousand patients in China with suspected COVID-19 who had both a PCR and CT chest performed. A small subset of these patients, 15 people, denoted again by these horizontal lines, had a negative PCR followed by a positive one with an average of five days between the tests. 93% of these patients had abnormalities on chest CT at the earlier time point suggesting the possibility that in suspected cases who are PCR negative, CT findings may be helpful in further stratifying clinical suspicion. And while identification of viral RNA is variable, as I've described, there's relatively little information to date about how well this correlates with shedding of actual viable and hence infectious virus. This is again the preprint posted of the nine mild cases in Germany, 
in these mild cases, they found live virus in the sputum only up to day eight. And while isolation of live virus correlates with PCR positivity, as seen in the right, um, PCR remained positive at times for weeks longer. Live virus shedding in severe cases has not yet been described. This study published last week in Emerging Infectious Diseases evaluated 468 confirmed transmission events of SARS-CoV-2 in mainland China to estimate the serial interval, which is the time between symptom onset in the transmitter and symptom onset in the transmit T. They found a mean serial interval of about four days. And importantly, their analysis estimates that 12.6% of transmissions are pre-symptomatic, an important finding when it comes to infection control on the population level within our healthcare facilities. So putting together a lot of what Aaron has just been going through over the last few slides, um, I, I, think, I think we're starting to see part of the reason that this has been so hard to contain, that, and, and because the pandemic, um, because, because so much transmission uh, is happening before people develop symptoms. So this was, this was a, a, an important modeling study um, uh, published last week um, that, that looked at the early epidemic in, in China, and it estimated that 86% of, of the early infections uh, may may have been missed and 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 um, and felt that these were either mild or completely asymptomatic. For the purposes of their modeling, they uh, they estimated that uh, that that these uh, uh, that these cases were half as infectious as the symptomatic infections. Although um, there's a lot of in some uh, there, there's a lot of assumptions uh, there that that have that have not yet been been proven. Next slide, please. So this was a very interesting uh, study that was published last week in, in JID. Uh, this was a cohort of 55 individuals in China. They're, uh, from the title, it says that they're asymptomatic, but they're actually pre-symptomatic. So, so these were individuals who were identified that they were, um, when they did contact tracing of known COVID patients, they found these eight, 55 people who were RT-PCR positive, and they actually admitted them all to the hospital. Then they followed them closely, and, and all of them develop symptoms between one and seven days later. So the, the implication here is that, is that people are shedding virus and potentially, uh, potentially infectious for uh, up, up to a week before they develop symptoms. Um, they found that younger people were more likely to have mild infections, uh, which, which, has been, um, which has also been seen in, in other studies to date. And they also, going back, to, uh, going back to the study that Aaron mentioned a few slides ago about uh, about the changes in the in the in the CT scans, possibly preceding symptom onset, all of these people, though they were they, though they though they were asymptomatic at the time of admission, remember they then developed symptoms one to seven days later. All of them had a CT scan at the time of enrollment, and remarkably, only 29% were completely normal. So again, those 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 changes in the CT um, it seemed to start very early in the course of infection, even before symptoms develop. Next slide. So this is an illustrative cluster of six infections during the early epidemic in China outside Wuhan that was published in JAMA. And there's also a reference below uh, to a very similar cluster just published in CID as well. Um, and so you can see patient one on the top line uh, traveled home from Wuhan on January 10th and had varying levels of close contact with uh, patients two through six, as you can see here in blue, over the course of the next few days. Uh, in the ensuing days to week, all of these other patients uh, became symptomatic, denoted here in orange, and were ultimately diagnosed with COVID-19 at the pink point along the line. Patient one, however, remained asymptomatic throughout the study period and was ultimately tested and found to be SARS-CoV-2 positive uh, 19 days later, suggesting that there, uh, you know, there, there truly can be truly asymptomatic uh, transmission if, these, if this case is to be believed. Um, and at this point, it's impossible to determine exactly what proportion of people infected with SARS-CoV-2 are truly asymptomatic. There was this small series on the left um, of initially asymptomatic household contacts who were PCR positive in Nanjing, China, that found that those who never developed symptoms, which was only about seven people, I believe, um, tended to be younger with the median age of 14 years, suggesting the possibility of a viral reservoir among asymptomatic children. Although, of course, it's, uh, you know, uh, should be interpreted with caution. Uh, 
And on the cruise ship, the Diamond Princess, uh, there was an estimated 17.9% uh, of the people there who were asymptomatically infected. Although again, these individuals were not uh, clearly followed long enough to see whether they should be more appropriately described as pre-symptomatic. Zero surveys will serve a crucial role in helping to answer this question. This is a table from an MMWR report published last week about an outbreak in a long-term care facility in Washington state. We include it here as an example of how badly transmission and outcomes can really go when uh, necessary precautions are not taken. At the time of this report, 81 out of 130 residents, 34 out of 170 staff members, and 14 uh, visitors had become infected. And I want you to focus for a minute on the left column, the, seven, uh, the 81 residents. You can see that the median age was 81, that there was a high degree of comorbidity, and that 27% died as of the time of this report. So truly a devastating uh, outbreak here. And the authors identified five key contributing factors to this catastrophic outbreak, um, all of which I'm sure are familiar to all of you to some extent within the various settings we are practicing in. First um, was that staff members worked while symptomatic. Second, um, staff members worked in more than one facility. Third, there was inadequate familiarity and adherence to necessary infection control uh, measures. Fourth, uh, there were challenges to implementing infection control because of inadequate PPE and hand sanitizer. And finally, there was delayed recognition of cases because of a low index of suspicion, limited availability of testing, and difficulty identifying cases based on signs and symptoms alone. And as a last word on transmission, we wanted to highlight these two studies looking specifically at close contact secondary attack rate. This top study is a preprint that looked at 391 confirmed cases and 1,286 close contacts in Shenzhen. Symptomatic cases were isolated and treated at designated hospitals regardless of test results, and contacts were isolated at home and monitored with release contingent on a negative PCR. Despite that, they found a 14.9% household secondary attack rate. The bottom study was the first, uh, first 10 identified cases in the United States, as well as 445 close contacts who had active symptom monitoring. They similarly found a 10.5% household secondary attack rate. This rate is of course presumed to be much higher in circumstances where cases are not identified and not isolated as in these two studies. Okay, so now I'm gonna uh, spend some time going through the spectrum of clinical presentation. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so I think what's becoming clear is there truly is a spectrum of presentation uh, for people with SARS-CoV-2 infection. So there are some patients who are truly asymptomatic. And again, I think as, as Aaron alluded to, to know the exact number of the, of the truly asymptomatic people, we are going to need good zero surveys. Um, then, then there are patients who are symptomatic but with mild and self-resolving symptoms. Most frequently, this seems to be a flu-like illness. Um, it can be an upper respiratory tract viral infection or even a gastroenteritis. Um, however, there's a subset of patients who progress from the initial mild phase of symptoms to a more severe phase. Uh, usually this phase requires hospitalization and sometimes the intensive care unit. Uh, some of these patients will have spontaneous recovery and others will progress into an ARDS pro-inflammatory syndrome, which can be quite severe and which may be responsible for a lot of the morbidity and mortality uh, caused by COVID-19. Next slide, please. So this table on the right here is compiled from several of the large cohort studies that were published throughout February about some of the, uh, some of the hospitalized cases in, uh, in China. And, uh, and so it, it, it sought to look for the, what were the major presenting symptoms uh, of, of, of all these hospitalized patients. Again, I, I think a caveat is um, this may have missed a large uh, as that modeling study suggested, may have list, missed a large proportion of the more mild or, or, and the asymptomatic cases. So again, this is just for the hospitalized patients. As you can see, what, what they were describing uh, most commonly was fever, cough, myalgias, and fatigue, with sore throat less common, and with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea quite, quite unusual in these studies. And I think what's, what's, come, what's come out um, uh, uh, later, or more recently, is that GI symptoms may be more common than was initially recognized. Next slide, please. So actually, uh, this study was published last week and uh, followed a, a, a cohort of patients of 201 patients um, who, who uh, and, and assessed the, the likelihood of GI symptoms. And so um, 
while it found that it was unusual for GI symptoms to be the, the, the sole manifestation of the syndrome, so only about 3%, it found that 42% of people had GI symptoms as part of their, of, as part of their syndrome. Next slide, please. So this was uh, one of the first large uh, cohorts reported in the New England Journal uh, last month was this large cohort study um, of, 100, of 1,099 hospitalized patients uh, from China. And this, this, these were the um, initial labs and, and radiographic findings on, on presentation. Um, th this, doesn't separate, uh, this doesn't separate those who, uh, who, who end up having severe, uh, so more, more severe presentations um, uh, for, from, from those who don't. But as you can see, um, the, the major abnormalities that um, uh, for, for, for the vast majority of people, including abnormal findings on their CT scans and lymphopenia. Early on, so you know, at the time of admission, an elevated procalcitonin was quite unusual, although even at the time of admission, there was, the, there was elevation in some of the other inflammatory markers, so CRP, uh, LDH, and D-dimer, for instance, as you can see there. Next slide, please. So this, this is, uh, um, again, a very interesting study looking at 81 hospitalized patients in Wuhan who, who all had CT abnormalities. And what they've done, the groups on the bottom of each of these graphs, so groups one through four, uh, break up the patients by, by, their, by, the, by the point in time in their disease course. So group one were people who were still pre-symptomatic. Group two were people who had symptoms less than seven days. Group three were people who had symptoms for one to two weeks. And, um, and group four was people who had symptoms for two to three weeks. So on the graph on the, on the left, you can see how the number of involved lung segments uh, changes with time. So, so even as, as, as was mentioned in a few studies uh, earlier, you can see even before symptom onset, there are, there are changes um, in, in the lung that are seen. They tend to be in fewer lung segments. That, that increases as you, as you become symptomatic and, and you, start to see, you start to see some, some resolution by the third week of symptoms. On the graph on the right, you can see how the quality of the changes on the CT scan changes with time. So early on, so in these pre-symptomatic individuals, the predominant abnormalities are ground glass opacities. As you move into the first and, and the second week of symptoms, you, can, you start to see some more consolidation. And then, and, then, and then the consolidation starts to resolve as you, as you get into the, into the third week of symptoms. Next slide, please. So this is a slide that we made to try to describe what we know about the COVID-19 disease course. So trying to put together all the things that we've talked about so far. So in the blue line in the middle of the screen, you can see the various stages of the disease. So starting with the incubation period, progressing to the acute mild phase, then to an ARDS pro-inflammatory phase, and then to recovery. So um, if we go back to the incubation period, uh, you can see uh, in, the, in the yellow line above, we tried to estimate um, the, 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 um, the, the amount of time that, that people spend in each of these phases. So again, the median we think is about 5.1 days for the incubation period. On the plot below the incubation period, you can see there's a wide distribution, including, uh, including as Aaron mentioned, one out of 100 people who can, who can have an incubation period greater than 14 days. Um, symptom onset you, uh, typically means entry into the acute mild phase. And uh, this is, again, marked by these nonspecific flu-like symptoms most commonly. So fevers, cough, myalgias, fatigue, although GI symptoms can be seen perhaps less than 50% of the time. This can last about five to 10 days and then either ends with recovery. So those are the, the people who have more of a mild syndrome, um, a mild self-limited syndrome, or, or to progression to, to more severe symptoms, including progression into this ARDS pro-inflammatory phase. And the hallmarks really seem to be, uh, the, the, the hallmarks of progressing from this acute mild phase into a more severe phase are dyspnea, tachypnea, and hypoxemia. Once, uh, once in this ARDS pro-inflammatory phase, this can last for days to weeks and either ends in recovery or demise. Um, above the phases, you can see we've tried to plot the, uh, what, what we know so far about the SARS-CoV-2 viremia. And so the important points are that uh, viral, viral loads rise far before symptom onset, possibly peaking around the time of symptom onset and then, and then declining there afterwards. 
The other things that we've highlighted is that there, there, is a, there is a signal that perhaps people with more severe symptoms have higher viral loads and people with the most severe symptoms may, may, may have uh, viral shedding until death. Next slide, please. So this is a great figure from a, uh, from a paper published last week in the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplant that I think pretty much uh, describes what, what we said uh, in the last slide. So in general, again, there's an early phase that uh, where typical symptoms are, are, are really um, kind of those that you would expect from a viral illness. Uh, then there's progression to a pneumonia, which can progress to a hyperinflammatory stage where it's possible, and this is being investigated, that it's the overly exuberant host immune response that might be responsible for much of the morbidity and mortality associated with this stage of the illness. Next slide, please. So this is from a paper published in The Lancet earlier this month, and it reported on 191 critically ill patients in Wuhan. So all, again, all these patients were critically ill. We thought that this figure nicely showed the typical disease course for those who survived and those, and those who died. So the average age of the cohort was 56. Nearly half had comorbidities, including 30% with hypertension, 19% with diabetes, 8% uh, with heart disease, and 3% with COPD. 17% of the patients in this cohort required mechanical ventilation and two required ECMO. 28% of the cohort died. As you can see from the course, um, these patients eventually develop severe disease around day seven, uh, somewhere between day seven and 11. So they have, again, in those first six days, it's fever and cough and those more mild symptoms. Then, then they develop dyspnea, which is, the dark, which is um, kind of signaled by the dark blue line. Uh, eventually requiring IC, ICU admission. Um, so uh, in this study, they found the median time uh, to discharge, so from admission to discharge was 22 days, the median time to mechanical ventilation was 14.5 days, and the median time to death was 18.5 days. So again, the mechanical ventilation happening later, may, maybe in that second stage of, of, the, of the disease. Next slide, please. Um, so we're just going to uh, touch on what's known about the risk factors for severe disease. Next slide. So this is a this is a graph that we put together. We compiled from uh, many of the major uh, uh, cohort studies that have been reported, um, and and we and what we tried to do was look at uh, features that are associated with severe disease um, in 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 multiple studies. So. Um, Many of the epidemiological features are things that we've talked about from age to pulmonary uh, disease, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. Um, uh, uh, the, some of, some of the uh, things at the bottom of the slide, so biologics, transplant immunosuppression, and HIV are presumed, although, although there's just not enough known about it at, at, at this point, and it hasn't been reported widely yet. Um, uh, in terms of vital signs, th these are some of the vital sign abnormalities that, that have been associated with severe disease. And then there's a number of laboratory markers that seem to be associated with, with severe or, or worse, worse presentations, and I list a lot of them here. Next slide, please. So um, from a few of the studies, it was possible to see how, uh, how, these lab, how, how the laboratory markers, in particular for, uh, for describing this hyperinflammatory state, how they really separate between those who have severe presentations or, or those who are non-survivors and those who are survivors. So, um, here uh, on the left-hand side, you can see how uh, this is from, from one of the studies, how, uh, how D-dimer um, really uh, seems to elevate and separate in non-survivors compared to survivors. Um, and again, the rise really starting in that kind of five to seven day period as you're entering that second phase of the illness. On the right side, again, this, this was uh, from, from, um, uh, from, 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 an, from another one of, of the cohorts. And, and they looked at, it here, here you can see the separation of D-dimer, LDH, ferritin, and IL-6 in survivors versus non-survivors. Next slide. Uh, okay, so a word about case fatality risk, or the number of COVID-19 deaths divided by the total number of infections. So reported CFRs that you see from various places can be biased in two ways. Upwards, if mild cases are not being tested and identified, making the denominator too low, or downwards, if deaths have not yet occurred in the setting of ongoing illness, making the numerator too low. Both of these biases are likely at play with this pandemic, where cases are being under-identified and people who die often take two to three weeks or more to do so, as Eric just uh, discussed. So this analysis was published in Nature last week to try to account for these biases and estimate 
the symptomatic case fatality risk or the proportion of people with symptomatic infection who die. Um, and they did this during the early uh, epidemic in Wuhan. And as shown in the top figure, they used the prevalence of infection in travelers on commercial and charter flights leaving Wuhan, who were more systematically tested than the broader population at the time as an estimate of population prevalence of infection. And then on the bottom, they used the first 425 cases to estimate the growth rate and to identify epidemiologic parameters. They used this information to estimate age-specific symptomatic case fatality risks at various probabilities of symptomatic infection, um, getting an overall symptomatic CFR of 1.4% using a symptomatic probability of 0.5. Uh, in this figure, you can see the age distribution of symptomatic CFRs, ranging from 0.3% for those under 30 to 2.6% for those over 59, and increasing fairly precipitously in the highest age groups. So let's talk about, uh, let's touch upon a few special populations. Um, first of all, there have been a number of relatively small case series of outcomes for pregnant women, all in their third trimester. There's been no evidence of vertical transmission or poor maternal or fetal outcomes, although many of these cases were delivered via C-section, presumably out of caution. Because of this very limited information, these data should, of course, be interpreted with caution, and, and, and uh, much more uh, study needs to be done before we can conclude uh, whether or not um, pregnant women are at higher risk for either maternal or fetal poor outcomes. And there have been two relatively sizable studies published in the last few weeks about confirmed infection in children. The first was this study during the Korean outbreak, during which the authors report 201 children with confirmed COVID-19, of whom only 15.9% were under the age of 10, represented by blue bars in the figure. They reported no deaths and that the majority of the cases were mild, although details about the severity were not reported beyond that. This is another study of children uh, in China that was published last week in the New England Journal. They found that 1% of over 72,000 cases overall were children. And at one uh, children's hospital, uh, 1,391 children were tested and only about 12% were positive with a median age close to seven. You can see the presenting symptoms below, which were varied. And of these children, three required ICU, all with comorbidities and one died. And we've seen very, very rare cases of children uh, dying from this illness, including, unfortunately, uh, reports of one just in the last couple of days in, in uh, the United States. Okay, so now we're gonna go through uh, with you some slides on management. And I think the first thing that is very important to say is to remember that there are no proven or approved treatments for this, uh, for COVID-19. And the drugs that we're going to be discussing are currently being used either in an off-label capacity or investigational agents. Next slide, please. So this is a sort of a high-level overview of what we're going to cover, uh, or it's rather an outline. And um, so we're going to go through some of the antiviral agents. Uh, so lopinavir, ritonavir, hydroxychloroquine. We'll say a word about hydroxychloroquine and azithro. Uh, we'll talk about the favipiravir study that uh, was published last week. Um, we're not going to touch on remdesivir or interferon because they're, they're current, remdesivir is currently under investigation and interferon as well, and there's no, there's no uh, good clinical data uh, published to date. And then in terms of the immunomodulators, we're going to go through the tocilizumab data uh, coming from a case series in China, uh, which is getting a, a lot of discussion. And, and there was a tiny series of three patients where IVIG was used. Uh, we're not going to touch on that uh, more today, though. Next slide, please. So, so this is just a slide uh, to say that there's clearly a lot of bad information about treatment uh, out there. And so these were some of the highlights just from the past few days. And I think uh, for us, it highlighted the importance of making sure that we're really looking at what data is out there um, and, and making sure that, that, it's, uh, that, that these agents are being, being assessed in a rigorous way. Next slide, please. So I think everyone has heard of the major uh, lopinavir ritonavir open label randomized control trial that was published last week in the New England Journal. Uh, lopinavir ritonavir again is an HIV protease inhibitor. It was found to have uh, in, vi in vitro activity against SARS by inhibiting that 3CL protease. Remember the prote one of the proteases that cleaves the non-structural proteins. There was a small non-randomized uh, 
study uh, with SARS that suggested a benefit to, to treatment with this agent, although it was never studied rigorously. Importantly, the 3CL protease is highly conserved between SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2. And so there was a lot of interest in using this drug for COVID-19 patients. So this, this study, uh, again, the one that was published last week in the New England Journal is really a remarkable study. They enrolled 200 patients in a two week period at Wuhan and randomized, uh, at a hospital in Wuhan and randomized them one to one. Um, so the treatment group received lopinavir ritonavir at a standard dose of 400 milligrams with 100 milligrams twice daily for up to 14 days. The primary outcome was clinical improvement on a seven point scale, which ranged from death to being able to perform normal activities at home. At the time uh, of enrollment, the, the, media, the patients had symptoms for a median of 13 days. So again, a little bit later in the disease course. At the time of enrollment, 70% required supplemental oxygen, including 16% who, who were ventilated. The results showed no difference in the primary outcome. So overall, it was a negative trial. However, there was a trend towards faster clinical improvement among those in whom the drug was started before 12 days of symptoms. Additionally, the lopinavir ritonavir arm had fewer days in the ICU, so there was a median of six days versus 11 days. So all of this, you know, I think suggests that it's not useful late in disease, but it, but it should be studied earlier on. Next slide, please. So. Um, uh, we're going to uh, spend a couple slides on hydroxychloroquine, uh, which is getting a lot of uh, press right now. Uh, so hydroxychloroquine is an agent that was found to have in vitro activity for SARS-CoV-2 very early on in, in, the, in, the, in the pandemic. It is uh, thought to prevent binding at the ACE2 receptor and also to prevent intracellular transport of the virus in the endosome. So what is the data that's out there to date? So there was an interim report that was published very early on from China with essentially no details that said it had been used in over 100 patients with good safety and showed efficacy. This led to an expert consensus in China there, recommending it first line for everyone with mild, moderate, or severe disease there. Since that time, two small studies have been published, both in the last week or so. One is a tiny randomized control uh, trial of 30 patients that's summarized in the table on the left here. Um, in this study, they randomized patients one-to-one -to, -one to receive hydroxychloroquine or not. Um, they did also receive other antivirals, as you can see from the slide. So interferon alpha, everyone received umifenivir, 80% um, uh, of the hydroxychloroquine group and 66% of the non-hydroxychloroquine group received, and a couple patients in the non-hydroxychloroquine group received lopinavir ritonavir. Of note, most of these cases were, were mild, um, and, and they found no clinical difference among a number of, of um, of, uh, of, of endpoints, including those who, who had a negative throat swab at day seven, the median time to a negative viral load, days to being a febrile, and, and, um, and they had the same, same amount of uh, radiographic pr progression. There's also a second small non-randomized control uh, trial out of France, uh, which was published last week, um, uh, which I think led to the president's tweet, which looked at 26 patients on hydroxychloroquine versus 16 controls. They suggested that those who received hydroxychloroquine cleared the virus faster. However, they, what they had excluded six patients from the analysis in the hydroxychloroquine arm, including four who got worse, one of whom died and three of whom went to the ICU. So again, it seems like there is a lot of confounding here. I think the, the point is that these, this agent, um, it, it, it seems that it's really not, there's not enough data about it and it does need to be studied further. Next slide, please. So this was, the, this was what was being used at, uh, regarding the, the possibility of the synergy between hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. So this is from that same small French non-randomized uh, study that I, was meant, that I mentioned just a moment ago. And what they did is they found that there were actually six patients in the, HC, in the hydroxychloroquine arm who also received azithromycin. And they suggested that, that, that these people cleared their virus the fastest. And then they went as far as saying that this suggests that there could be synergy between the two agents. I think what's clear is there are massive limitations to the study and to interpreting anything from, from this graph, but it certainly, it certainly is an intriguing thought and it is something that is gonna be studied further. Next slide, please. So uh, favipiravir is an RNA, uh, an RNA dependent RNA, uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase inhibitor. 
and so there was a small uh, open label non-randomized uh, control trial that was published last week out of China. Uh, patients received either uh, favipiravir plus inhaled interferon, and they were compared to historical controls who had received lopinavir, ritonavir, and, and inhaled interferon. There were 35 patients in the treatment arm compared to 45 historical controls. They found that the mean time to viral clearance was four days in the favipiravir arm and nine days in the lopinavir, ritonavir arm. And this was statistically significant, as you can, and, and you can see the separation in the chart on the, on the left. Um, of note, the treatments were started uh, in, all, in all patients who had uh, symptoms for seven days or less. So again, I think getting, uh, uh, starting to get to the question that was raised in the lopinavir or ritonavir RCT about, about whether, uh, you know, uh, uh, about the, the importance of, of starting, of starting uh, these antiviral agents early. Uh, they also noted that favipiravir was better tolerated than, than lopinavir or ritonavir. Next slide, please. So finally, I'm going to discuss uh, the data that is out there for tocilizumab. And, and obviously, this is getting a lot of attention. And I would just point out that this is all from a preprint out of China. Uh, the, the citation, again, as usual, is at the bottom of the slide on the left. Um, and this, in, this was a case series of 21 patients. The baseline characteristics of the patients are in the table on the left. Uh, you can see the average age was about 57 years, and, and there was a lot of comorbidities. To be included in the series, they needed to either meet severe or critical uh, criteria. So 81% were severe, of whom 45% were on high flow nasal cannula, and 19% were critical. The table that we've made on the right, on the bottom right, shows what they, what they use for criteria for severe. So you need, for severe, it was respiratory rate greater than 30, uh, saturate, uh, uh, um, an SpO2 of less than 93% on ambient air, or P to F less than 300. And the criteria for critical were respiratory failure requiring mechanical ventilation or ECMO, shock, or multi-system organ failure requiring ICU admission. And uh, to, give, to get tocilizumab, you needed bilateral infiltrates plus either of these criteria. Again, all 21 of the patients in this, in this case series got it. And their protocol was if you met the criteria, you were given a dose of 400 milligrams of tocilizumab. Uh, this was repeated in three patients who had a fever within 12 hours of the first dose. Many, most, or maybe all re also received methylprednisolone, although it's unclear the dose, duration, and the exact details uh, of the steroid administration from this preprint. Next slide, please. So um, this is um, this slide shows the results of the of the report from that. And so again, uh, what they stress is that there was ex they, they felt it had an excellent safety profile. They note that 19 of the 21 patients in their series are discharged uh, to remain in the hospital at the time the study was published. They do note that the average time of hospitalization after the tocilizumab dose was 13.5 days. So on the right, I'm gonna take you through the, the data that, that they have. So as you can see on the x-axis is days after tocilizumab uh, dose, uh, day one, um, uh, I guess, uh, it, yeah, so, so uh, there's a before and then there's a day one up to day five. And what you can see is there's a rapid normalization of CRP, a normalization of temperature, uh, that, that's the, on the top two. On the um, bottom left, you can see there is a, there's a, a, a decline in the, in the amount of supplemental oxygen required by these patients. And then on the bottom right, there's, a, there's a, 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 an increase in the arterial saturation of oxygen for these patients. Next slide. Uh, okay, so to close, I uh, wanted to go through a couple studies about population risk and mitigation. This first study um, is a preprint that looked at healthcare load and capacity in two areas of China, uh, Wuhan on the left and Guangzhou on the right. And if you look in the figure on the left, these bars here are the number of confirmed cases corresponding to counts uh, on the y-axis, um, with the darker colors being critically ill and the darkest color being deaths. This blue line here is the number of hospitalizations per 10,000 adults corresponding to the y-axis on the left. And you can see the precipitous rise in hospitalizations during the course of the epidemic in Wuhan. There were an average of 3,000, nearly 3,500 serious inpatient admissions every day. And during the peak, there were over 19,000 hospitalized patients, nearly 10,000 of which were serious and 2,000 of which were receiving critical care. And finally, if you look at these gray lines uh, here, 
This, this line here is the average ICU bed capacity in the United States. The bottom line is the empty ICU capacity. And this is the, uh, the number of US inpatient beds in a community hospital. And so you can illustrate clearly the level of overload that would occur in the United States from an epidemic of this size. On the, on the right uh, figure, on the other hand, you can see the comparable figure in Guangzhou, uh, which initiated strict measures within one week of case importation. And you can notice the vast differences in uh, the y-axis from the left figure, uh, with these numbers being much smaller than over here. Uh, and during the peak in Guangzhou, there were 15 patients in critical condition and 38 serious, uh, highlighting the potential importance of population-wide measures in, in uh, controlling healthcare load. This is another preprint that looked at transmission dynamics during four time periods in Wuhan. You can see the number of identified cases by time period with their model fit on the, on the left figure. The first time period was from January 1st to January 11th when there were no uh, restrictions. The second time period was from January 11th to January 23rd when there were no restrictions but massive human movement because of the Spring Festival. During the third time period, which is January 23rd to uh, February 2nd, there was mandatory social distancing, travel restrictions, public transport suspension, and closing of businesses. And finally, during the last period, uh, January 2nd to, or sorry, February 2nd to February 18th, there was the addition of centralized quarantine in hotels, field hospitals, and central hospitals for all suspected and confirmed cases. Um, the right figure shows the calculated effective transmission coefficient during each time period, meaning the number of uh, further cases that each infected person was likely to infect. Um, and so you can see that uh, during the first two time periods, uh, when there were no restrictions in place, this effective transmission uh, coefficient was close to four. Um, and with uh, mandatory social distancing, uh, this fell to 1.26. Uh, which is lower, but still not low enough to, to prevent ongoing propagation of the epidemic, and finally fell below one when a system of central quarantine was implemented, suggesting the possible importance of a central quarantine system to separate uh, uh, infections from the general population. So just to close, in summary, you know, we went over a lot of different uh, uh, studies here today, but some of the takeaway points that we were hoping to to, to emphasize, first of all, that the incubation period of the infection is highly variable with a median of five days. Second, that viral shedding seems to precede symptom onset and seems to be higher and longer in more severe cases. Um, there is substantial pre-symptomatic transmission. Um, uh, next, that there are the CT and uh, IgM may both be useful adjuncts for diagnosis that there's a broad spectrum of clinical presentation ranging from mild or asymptomatic to ARDS and a pro-inflammatory state, that some important risk factors for severe disease include age, older age, comorbidities, and certain laboratory abnormalities, and that there, importantly, there are no proven treatments, although lots um, are under investigation. So with that, we have a couple minutes. So if you want to ask some questions, I think if you want to say something, maybe you can raise your hand. Otherwise, we can look at the chat. Um, Eric and Aaron, this is Raj. Really exceptionally outstanding presentation. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um, quick question. Um, you distinguish the anti the um, phase of the disease where the virus may be contributing substantially versus the phase of the disease where perhaps an over exuberant immune response is, is part of the clinical deterioration. Obviously, we need to know more about that. Any data from autopsy studies that can help us understand the contributions of the virus versus inflammation? People are talking about autopsy studies out of out of China and elsewhere, but I don't know if You've seen data to help us understand these different phases, uh, viral versus inflammatory. Yeah, I have not specifically seen that myself. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Eric, have you seen autopsy studies? So um, we're, I was trying to find a few studies related to that, and, and there are a couple, but they seem to be, um, they seem to be um, not in English from, from, from what I could see. So I think that was, that's one thing that, um, that hopefully we'll have more clarity on. Eric and Aaron, this is Dan. Um, that was a great talk. The um, CID study that you cited about IgM and CT scan used oral swabs rather than nasopharyngeal swabs. And so it, 
uh, while IgM may very well be useful in diagnosis, it could also be that there was just limited sensitivity of the way in which they were doing their PCR testing. Uh, you know, there's uh, some limited early experience here that uh, um, uh, initial negative tests uh, may be positive when a second test is uh, done, meaning a second nasopharyngeal swab. So um, it, I'm not sure how adequate the sampling was uh, in that uh, study uh, in CID. Thanks, Dan. Um, Looks like in the chat there's a question from Keeman about uh, about BMI as a risk factor, and we've you know I think uh, um, anecdotally we've seen that from from Okay, sorry, there was a bad echo. So, oh, it's happening again. Um, so, so uh, basically, uh, Keeman, we we looked for that because we've seen obviously a lot of that in our population so far, and and it, I think it. It hasn't been it hasn't been well well reported that 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 we could see. Uh, let's see what other uh, questions. Um, there's a questions about there's a question about HIV and TB patients. Uh, as far as I know, there's been very little reported specifically about these populations and how uh, how they in, in particularly are affected uh, with COVID nineteen. I mean. We presume that uh, people with uncontrolled HIV or with tuberculosis uh, may, be, may be higher risk just in the sense that they are immunosuppressed and have comorbidity, but that's not, there's no data to, to suggest that specifically. Um, let's see. Uh, Jake Lemieux says there are striking differences in crude fatality rates between countries, e.g. Germany with an apparently low crude fatality rate, is the sense that this is an ascertainment or are they doing something different clinically? Uh, I mean, my sense is that there could be multiple kind of contributions. Mm -hmm. You know, first of all, that there, you know, that it can be as, as far as identification and how many uh, cases are being identified. Second, you know, the population distribution. We know that there are very clear risk factors for severe outcomes. So in older populations or in sicker populations. Uh, um, and of course, there may be some elements of, of clinical management and healthcare load as well. Um, but I think that I haven't seen anything definitively saying why that is specifically. Uh, question about recording. I think Jen can comment on that, but I think a recording will, should be available. Oh yeah, she said that slides in the recording will be posted. Um. Uh, uh, Aaron and Eric, if I can just make one other quick comment. Um, there was an absolutely outstanding presentation yesterday from the HHS Emergency Response Group uh, that it should be available online that uh, I forget the person who spoke from Emory from their um, the special pathogens unit and about the ICU management of, uh, of patients and addressed some of these issues around secondary infections and the like. Uh, people should really take the time to watch that. Yeah, no, uh, I watched that yesterday. It was really, really good and very interesting about the critical care management specifically. Um, Would someone send that around the link? Dan, do you have the... I have the link and can send it. I have the link to the original meeting. I'm not sure what the link is to the recorded meeting, but it, uh, I'll send that and then you can uh, search for it based on that. Okay. Um, all right. So let's keep moving here. So have there been reports about secondary infections, co-viral or others with COVID? Um, I, I think it's, I've seen, I've seen several reports about influenza co-infection and there was that series out of, uh, on the West Coast, I think it was maybe Stanford, where they saw a substantial number of viral co-infections. And then there were a couple cohort studies in China where I saw that secondary bacterial infections were associated with poor outcomes, which is not surprising. Um, anything else you've seen, Eric? No, that's, I, I think that's it. 
Uh, question about immunocompromised or transplant patients. I, I haven't seen any data specifically looking at that population yet. Eric? Same. Okay. Uh, all right. So revisiting diagnostics in the era of social isolation where patients might be staying home for several days before coming into the hospital with lower tract disease. Many of us wonder whether we might require sputum sampling for patients with lower disease who have negative NP swabs, though there are many logistical issues regarding sputum collection in the outpatient setting in particular. And in the inpatient setting, uh, the rapid test cannot be run on lower tract specimens. That's a comment from Rocio, which I think is well taken. I think a concern of a lot of people. Uh, okay. Uh, John Herman comments that the serologies have been to two different viral proteins, spike and nucleocapsid, and there may be a different response and usefulness in diagnosis. Um, a question about remdesivir and convalescent serum, which I think, uh, you know, stay tuned because I don't think the data are available yet and the studies are ongoing, but we'll see. And then Paul Sachs asks, should we be isolating and screening all admitted patients right now, even without symptoms? No answer right now, but something to consider as we identify more atypical cases and there being a pre-symptomatic shedding phase. So Any? I want to comment on that, Sibar. There is a big debate, and some hospitals in New York have started to screen asymptomatic pregnant women. Um, it's highly debatable because of the pretest probability, but we'll probably have some data from them as they do it. So it would be interesting to see. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're out of time. So unless there's any, anyone has any last comments, thank you very much for joining us. And we'll be posting the slides and uh, recording. Thank you. All right.